found where, you, hey, honey, I'm going to go read a book. <laughs> and, no, you go to the library, you take the tunnel into the prostitute's place, and, uh, uh, and so you know where they are because they have a footprint. You can see it right there. It's a photo of it, of where you go to get to the prostitutes. And so this, is, this was a really common place, and so it was a terrible, terrible place. But there was a church there that was very committed and had a love for God. But there's something about this society that the commitment that they had was like next to zero to your loved one, to your spouse. It was next to zero. That was in the society itself. There wasn't any real strong commitment, love relationship. It was like you know, prostitutes everywhere. It was like nothing. And so um, now we're looking at a letter that God sent. We're going to read this. A letter that God sent to, via word of mouth from a prophet, to a church in Ephesus. Okay? We're going to read this letter now. That's right. Uh, let's go ahead and read it. Write this uh, to the angel of the church of Ephesus. These words are spoken by the one who holds the seven stars safe in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works. I know what you've done. I know how hard you have worked and what you have endured, and I know that you will not tolerate wicked men and that you have put to the test self-styled apostles who are nothing but of the sort, and have found them to be liars, and I know your power of endurance and how you've suffered for the sake of my name and have not grown weary. So he's talking to this church, and he's really complimenting them. Yeah, I know what you've done, and I like it, okay? But he goes on to say, but I hold this against you, that you do not love as you did at first. Remember? Then how far you have fallen. Repent and live as you lived at the first. Otherwise, if your heart remains unchanged, I shall come to you and I'm going to remove your lampstand from its place. And yet you have this to your credit that you hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, and which I myself detest. And, and let every listener hear the Spirit. What, what the Spirit says to the church is, uh, to the victorious I will give the right to eat of the tree of life which grows in the paradise of God. Very interesting text and letter to this church. But what it's talking about is their love relationship with Christ. See, that's the foundation of Christianity. Not that you just want the culture of Christianity in your marriage or in your household or in your kids. Not that you just like it yourself. No, but the whole purpose and the foundation of why we live for God, why we serve God, is because of our love relationship with Christ. And we've got really good reason to love Christ. Our love for him grows more and more, the Bible says. Yes, we love him because he first loved us when we were entirely unlovable. In the thick of sin, he loved us. So, being in love, especially if you're married, you're fascinated by that other person. You admire, you adore, you enjoy, you appreciate, you cherish, and you prize. That's a love relationship. In 1 Corinthians, it tells us love knows no limit to its endurance, no end to its trust, no fading of its hopes, and it cannot last anything. It is, in fact, the one thing that still stands when all else has fallen, your love. When everything seems to co collapse in a love relationship between a husband and wife, when everything else seems to be that you still have love. And then you really miss when you're apart. And I remember traveling around the world preaching, and for five years I was all over the place. And I hated going to places and to see things and to not have Kathy there to share them with me. 
well, the other pastor, but it was something about Kathy being there and just, you know, to share these moments together that I just so missed being apart. Missed, missed being, being together, I mean. And so anyways, in our love relationship with Christ, from the get-go when you first get saved and you sense his love for you and, and what he's done for you, it's just so real and fresh. Well, <laughs> you know, you really are into it. You're going after Christ with everything you have. And, and uh, you know, it could be months down the road, but your mind is still like, no, <laughs> Jesus is just so good how he's forgiven me and, and, and blessed me and he's helping me and I'm seeing it move. And, and, and so you're celebrating every little triumph that God gives to you. And, and uh, you just want everybody to love him too. You want everybody. You just want people to know how good he is. And so, and you take great pride in, in your Jesus and in God and and then there's a protection that comes for his name. And it bothers you when somebody uses the, the name of the Lord in vain and uses, you know, Jesus Christ is a curse word, you know. It just bothers you and and because uh, uh, you got life. You found life when you found the Son and, and you just feel alive and, and um, <laughs> you feel safe. Though the world doesn't understand who you are and misinterprets, but with God, he knows you and he understands you and, and you just feel safe. You can be yourself with God. In fact, life itself without love is worthless. Life itself without, especially this love. Let me read you in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This is a love chapter. If I speak in the eloquence of men and of angels but have no love, I become a blaring brass or clanging cymbal. And if I have a gift of fortune telling and future and, and, and hold my mind, not only all humans knowledge, have all human knowledge, but the very secrets of God. And if I have, have that absolute faith which can move mountains, but have no love, I am not to nothing at all. Nothing. And if I dispose of all that I possess. Yes, even if I give my own life to be burned, but have no love, <laughs> I've achieved nothing. So, without love, love for God, this kind of love in a relationship, I'm telling you, without that, you really do have nothing. And that's the reason for all that we do is because we love him. Everything we do, we love and we want to please him. We want to be with him, not just in heaven, but we want his presence in our life. And we want to worship him and, um, and we want to give back to him. Everything we do is because of our love relationship with Christ. That's the foundation. And even the Bible talks about, you know, the greatest thing of all. Look at this verse. In this life, you have three, three great lasting qualities, faith hope, and love. But the greatest of them is love. Above everything, above faith, hope, love is the greatest. And that's the foundation of Christianity. Praise God. Well, they had that. The Ephesus church had that. But again, in their culture, they experienced what they thought was love, but there wasn't a commitment level. They didn't really understand the love that the Bible talks about, uh, and they had fallen from that first love that they had. And so in the letter that God sends them, he's saying, remember how far you've fallen. Remember. He's saying, look at where you were, and look at where you are. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Did you know that 80% of relationships that um, a couple has, if it's chemistry driven, what does that mean? That means you fornicate before you get married. And that turns the spin on everything. Because now it's not a love relationship, it's a lust relationship. And uh, you don't want to get that ball rolling. Do you get that ro rolling? You're talking 10 years of your marriage is going to be damaged 
because you fornicated before you got married. No kidding. It messes it up. And to talk to me, if you don't understand it, I'll explain it. I'll explain it. So, because they didn't have this sense in their society of a, of a love relationship, and, and uh, you know, in three years, they say, in three years, 80% of couples will break up. 80% that are married, they'll, they'll break up because they just got started on the wrong foot. Uh, but every one of them <laughs> believed, they absolutely believed that their, their passion and their feelings, yeah, you know, that w- you know, we're going to overcome the odds. It's really feel passionate about you and your feelings. Are, no, no, it's not going to carry you through. It doesn't carry you through. And yet that's what a lot of religion is today. Is it's nothing more than just feelings. On the surface, feelings. They, they feel God or, or they go into the Catholic Church, it just seems so holy. Shh. Wake us out. Wake somebody out. <laughs> but they but they but they feel, they just oh, I just I just feel, you know, goosebumps. It is feelings. Surface level, it's feelings and and uh, you know, and just their their heart kind of kind of kind of there's a passion, you know, for, for God, this, this holy, holy, awesome God. And, and, you know, it's just feelings. It's surface level. And it's not going to carry you through, especially when the tough times come. It will not carry you through. And so a love relationship with God, it goes deep. And with your wife, your husband, it goes deep, deep, really deep. Uh, and... Um, even still, it's not definite. You can seriously be in true love. Not just the, you know, fantasy stuff and not the lustful stuff, but you can still have true love. But even still, it's not a definite thing. That has to be worked on. Just because it's real doesn't mean that that real love is going to continue. It has to be worked on. Your love relationship with your wife, as in your love relationship with God, there has to be effort. There has to be attention. There has to be care. There has to be consideration, which is care on steroids. There has to be communication. There has to be trust. There has to be the cheerleading on the sidelines. Go, go, I believe in you. You have to continue to go after. Continue. I remember one time, Kathy, 16 years old. I'm 17 years old. No, Kathy, 50 and I'm 17 years old. And yet, you know, she was sick. And she didn't go to school that day. And, you know, after I got off my, my bus... Uh, uh, that afternoon, I had a bicycle. Arizona, desert, 12 miles, pedaling, <laughs> to see her at her house. And she was sick. I was prepared. I had a gas mask. <laughs> I walked in, she looked, she's like, what the heck? Yeah. Kathy, I'd pedal 12 miles. I'd pedal 24 miles for you today. <laughs> In a blizzard. <laughs> no, it, there has to be this continually going after that relationship. Hallelujah. So the Ephesus church, they did a lot right. When you read the text, man, the patience they had for God to come through in a time of persecution Brutal persecution, but they had staying power. No, we're living for God. We're living for God. And, uh, and they really had sound doctrine. They tested all the guys that came in and preached this and preached that. They're like, no, 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 no. You think you're an apostle? Uh, we don't buy it. Move on. They hated these imposters. And then they dealt with sin. They dealt with it. They hated evil in the church. They said, no, no, we're not going to let uh, 
homosexuals that still want to be homosexuals come and be part of our church. You want to repent? Hey, no problem. We love you. Come on in. But you're not going to stay a prostitute. You're not going to stay, you know, uh, 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 you know homosexual. You, 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 you're not going to stay a murderer. We're going to ask you to quit murdering, okay? <laughs> All right. It's just, no. But, but we'll love you if you repent. And, uh, and you can be part. So, but they dealt seriously with sin. They had a lot of good things going, but then God takes a turn. He said, but I do have something against you. Something against you. You've lost the most important thing. Your love for God. Your love for God. It's growing cold. You've lost your first love. Are you keeping the motions? You got all the motions going. You got all the movement. That, you know, that's, that's great. But the sizzle fizzled. You lost the first love. Now, how does that happen? How, do, how does that actually happen? Well, <clears throat> to begin with, other things just seem to take the place of our love for God. Other things that, you know, the novelty's worn off. All the newness of it is worn off. All the, you know, we've seen the miracles. We've seen the little things that God's done throughout our lives. It's all exciting. To, but all that's kind of like, Rubbed off, you know, we know the songs, you know, we, you know, we know how this goes. And, and so all that's just kind of, and we, and we get busy. And we neglect that love relationship. And that happens in a lot of marriages. They just neglect that. They get busy. They're both going directions. And, and so, uh, so other things just kind of take the place of that love relationship that we had with Jesus. And, and, uh, and not just that, sometimes... Something else just directly moves in and takes our heart away. Another love. It just takes our heart away. Now, I, I found this, <clears throat> now, and I want to show you, but this is my family when, when, when I was growing up. You know, we actually got into the, the newspaper. There we go. So the headline here reads, The Sound of Music Turns on Buckholz Family. So that's my, uh, my mother and uh, all six of us kids. And there I am with my trombone. <laughs> I'm eight years old. Began to play the trombone, I think, at, at seven years old. And so, but look what I have. I, I'm going to highlight this a little bit. Because you know how you have positions, you know, in the trombone? Well, my arm didn't go out far enough to reach that final position. So I actually had a strap on my, on, on my wrist. <laughs> and I threw the slide, and it stopped right at the right place, <laughs> the sixth position. And uh, uh, then I'd, I, I, I'd catch it. I'd, I'd whip it back, and I'd catch it on its way up, and, and I could actually play like that. And so as I grew, my arm got longer, the strap got shorter. <laughs> and so uh, oh, I got many years behind that trombone. And I don't know how he did it, but Jay... <laughs> How do you do it? He talked me into buying a trombone. <laughs> Jay, when I get around him, he just makes me spend money. I don't know. He's got that knack. <laughs> Anyways, uh, uh, yeah, so I'm going to pull that thing out and we clean it up. Who knows? Who knows? But uh, that would be kind of fun. But in this article, as I'm reading it, that's why I'm going here, because we had quite a family. You know, you look at that family at... It really was quite a family, really together. We ate together, we prayed together, and, uh, and we went to church together. And uh, <clears throat> let me read it. When, the, when Ray and Rosetta Buckles exchanged wedding bands, they probably never thought there would be a third band. <laughs> One thing for sure, though, there's always harmony in the Buckles home. Until... another love that my father found that was maybe two years older than my older sister, oldest sister. Took him out. We had a great family. And after that, the whole thing just exploded. Everybody went every which way. 
It's a disaster. All my siblings. Another lover slipped in, picked my dad's heart. Just enough time that the family was destroyed and, <laughs> and she dumped him like a hot potato. Yeah. So another lover can step in. Or maybe, um, well, people of Ephesus got really wealthy and, and the culture there, they, they had culture in Ephesus. It was just, you're not talking about a little town, you're talking about a city like 250,000 people. It was very well cultured in the amphitheater and so on. You saw it for yourself. And, and so this love relationship uh, now with um, uh, God, Jesus, it, it, had, it had just become like commonplace to them anymore. You began to see the footprints, you know, of maybe um, something new, something you need, really going to throw you. And um, God saw this. He saw this. Now, you never would have known because the church was really strong in a lot of ways. But God saw, I have something against you. And he mentioned this, and um, he saw that they were all into other things. He saw their excitement was about other things. He saw that. And he mentions it. And, and so, you know, their standards had dropped. What one day was, uh, no, no, I know that God wants this and, and God doesn't want us to do that. And now all those standards seem to change and loosen up and, and the priority of uh, what at one time was just really important. It's not so important anymore. And, uh, and their sensitivity to sin, uh, you know, had kind of been whittled down and, and they weren't bothered like they used to be bothered. Uh, and, you know, people using the name of Jesus just got kind of used to it. And, um, you know, the Bible says these words in Matthew 24. During the last days, in the latter times, sin will be rampant everywhere. Can you say amen? amen. Everywhere. And the love of many will grow cold. Last days, that's the tendency. The people that have an on-fire heart for God on fire, yet, because of the sin that creeps in, and it causes that love to grow cold. And now you're no longer satisfied, and, uh, but other things do satisfy you. Jobs, and entertainment, sports, and hobbies, and family, and we can go on, and, and but there's, Seems to be a less of a desire for the Word of God, the worship of God, prayer, evangelism. One time you couldn't hardly pass somebody. You felt like you had to tell them, but today it doesn't even cross your mind to tell them. And um, what you used to be broken for, <laughs> you got to get saved, you got to get saved, you know, that's gone. These are all signs of just losing your first love. Hallelujah. You know your relationship's in serious trouble. If that's the case, and a husband and a wife, you know, and your relationship can be in serious trouble if your heart doesn't change. It's in serious trouble. And um, not just that, but God tells them, look, you guys are a phenomenal church. You're doing this, you're doing that. And and you hate the Nicolaitans and, and so, but in the middle, I says, but I got this against you. And if you don't get this, I'm going to pull your lampstand. What that was, that lampstand was that they were to be a beacon to everyone around them and to many other lower, smaller churches. There would be a beacon of um, what you need to be like. This is my example, the lampstand. Church, yeah, yeah, that's what we need to go after. That's what we need to become. And so, you know, he says, I got to remove your lampstand. Though everything else is going on well, but if, if, if you don't get this right, I'm taking that candlestick, uh, and now you're going to be uh, no longer an example, and you're going to be left struggling in a very dark 
world. Hallelujah. So, he mentions this in the letter, and then he tells him in verse 4, remember, from how far you've fallen, repent and live as you lived at the first. So, simple as that. Remember. Remember how you were before you got saved, and then you got saved, right? Remember <laughs> that love relationship. And then, Repent. If you're going a certain way, God says, just go this way. <laughs> and uh, a decision now to go the right direction. You have to repent to see in your heart, you know what, God? I have lost what I once had. I was so excited about. There was a smile on my face. I had a song to sing. And yet now, I have to make myself go to church. Hey, remember? Okay, hopefully you are. And then repent. Go after that again. And he's basically saying, return. Go back and live like you lived at the beginning. Go back to when you burned for Christ. You had daily disciplines. You're eager to be involved, excited to do whatever, whatever for the Lord. In fact, can I suggest Go on a second honeymoon with our God. Just time close together, communicating, and just uh, just a sincere worship. Pull in a second honeymoon with our Savior. Hallelujah. Don't let the feel of your first love and all of that be removed. You already know. <laughs> uh, and you're completely happy with well, you can regain the spark. It can be found again. He wouldn't tell them to do this if they couldn't do it. But he was commanded them to do it. Go back to that first love, and uh, you can be excited about your relationship once again. You know, the Bible says, enjoy the wife of your youth. You ever ran across that verse? Enjoy the wife of your youth. So that tells you that they're no longer youth, but that tells the man, you know what, just enjoy her like you did when you were in your youth. The wife of your youth, you still got her, enjoy her like that. The wife of your youth, go back and enjoy. Praise God. You know, he did say at the very tail end of this something interesting. He said, if you overcome this, if you overcome, let me say, to the victorious, I'll give the right to eat from the tree of life, which flows from paradise, the paradise of God. Now, remember, this is the tree that Adam and Eve, Eve could not eat of. They couldn't. They had the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and then they had this tree of life, both in the Garden of Eden. Right? But when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God says, we cannot let them eat of the tree of life because they're in sin and, and we can't let them live forever like that. They've fallen. And so he sealed that up, put an put, put a, 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 you know, a angel in charge of it. Don't let them even get close to that. But in the verse we just read, again, the ones that overcome here, if you can go back and hold and maintain, regain, maintain that first love, I'm going to give you the right to eat of that tree of life. I'm going to give you that right, and you'll live forever, because that's what God wants, the kind of people God wants with them, the kind of hearts God wants with them for eternity. Hallelujah. So we're talking about something really important that we don't want to lose. I want to close with just this analogy in Hawaii on the North Shore that um, that's why they have the huge waves. By the way, in the wintertime, they're incredibly huge waves on the North Shore. Um, well, they built a, what they called the House of Refuge back in the 1800s. They built the House of Refuge, and, and what it was, it was completely put there so that they could be at the ready to go out 
and rescue surfers and sailors and, and people that got caught up in these huge waves. Or Hundreds of people were saved over the years because of that house that was built there, the, uh, the house of rescue. But today, it's a tourist attraction. You can go and look at it, and uh, it's a tourist attraction, yeah. Though people often die out in those waves. But it's nothing more than just a tourist attraction with nobody that has an interest or the passion to pay attention to people dying anymore. It's kind of sad. So this movement had now become nothing more than a monument. God forbid. So for us, let's not lose what it's all about, that, that lover, because we will also become once a movement, but we'll become a monument. Nothing more than that in a show. And uh, so the Bible says, I'll leave you with this in closing. Love the Lord God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. That is the greatest commandment, to love the Lord God. And Father, that's exactly